before starting this episode, I want to mention that historians have a few limitations to understanding women who were actually sex workers in the past. Why? Plenty of single women, or perceived to be immoral women, were automatically added to the category over the years. Also, because of the stigma attached to sex work, it's inevitable that diaries and other primary sources recording dalliances with sex workers or texts written by them were destroyed over the years. But still, a rich history remains. This is a look back at that history of consensual cisgendered female sex workers and a recounting of their evolution under the thumb of men. In this, the season finale of Let's Talk About Sex History, we'll be discussing pussy, power, and patriarchy. Up until the mid 18th century, in America, full service sex work was casual and clandestine, with sex workers or women accused of being sex workers often the first women in American settlements. In New England, for example, by the 1660s, the stoic Puritans who hadn't gravitated away from the faith were accusing women of being prostitutes. New England was filled with ports and randy sailors coming and going, after all. But other early cities to see the most prostitution were filled. Philadelphia, New York, Charleston, New Orleans, and Newport, Rhode Island. While London was known for its bustling street walking trade, the sparsely populated yet to be country that was America had no street walking, but we know there were a few brothels. In Charleston, Massachusetts in 1672, one Alice Thomas was convicted of giving frequent, secret, and unreasonable entertainment in her house to lewd, lascivious, and notorious persons of both sexes and giving them opportunity to commit carnal wickedness. Massachusetts in general had a lot of disorderly or body houses, old terms for brothels. The state's general court complained that the sin of whoredom and uncleanness grows amongst us. The whoredom would only grow thanks to the acceleration of trade and city growth. In 1721, 700 men were settled in Louisiana. The French government sent 80 women, many who had been believed to be prostitutes, to marry the men, but instead they engaged in commercial sex because they realized what a hot commodity they were. A second batch of more respectable women was sent later that year to marry the men. Speaking of the French, during the French-Indian War, women followed camp settlements to ply their trade. As for the growing availability of brothels, police officers rarely raided them and often protected workers in exchange for money, food, or sex. By the late 1770s, it was reported in the city that became synonymous with American independence that prostitutes in Philadelphia are so many that they flood the streets at night. In 1784, a newspaper recognized prostitution as a central and recognized institution of the city of Philadelphia. Prostitutes were also regular fodder in popular fiction of the day. Erotic plays and books were available in a number of colonial bookstores and were collected by men of means like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. According to historian Jeffrey Stone, Tales of prostitutes were common in pamphlets, plays, songs, almanacs, and broadsides, which presented prostitution as a pervasive and accepted part of life. The book Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, more commonly known as Fanny Hill, followed the adventures of a prostitute with tons of euphemisms, and she even got a happy ending, no pun intended. But positive or neutral depictions of full service sex work in fiction didn't mean society accepted the women who chose to engage in it. There are a few incidents of working class attacks on brothels in the 1700s in Boston and New York. For two nights in 1793, New York men rioted and burnt down two brothels. But still, the trade grew and even spilled out onto the streets. By the 1830s, upper class working girls could be identified on the streets of New York City by ankle length skirts, bright colored clothing, and painted faces, all fashions shunned by respectable women. During the 19th century, domestic service was the most common way for a woman to make a living. But by 1850, one-fourth of all factory workers were women. Quite a few of these women quit these dangerous and back-breaking jobs to pursue sex work, which they saw as the better deal. The South was the region of the country with the smallest full-service sex work industry before the Civil War, as men with the means to buy sex were mostly slave owners who had control over the bodies of white and black women thanks to their patriarchal dominance. I also find it worth mentioning that during slavery, there was a quote unquote fancy trade in which light skinned black women were bought and traded specifically for domestic and sex service in New Orleans. Slave traders scoured the upper south for such women. 
So the Civil War brought about a few changes. For one thing, due to the destitution and the disruption of the war across the South, and many more women left to fend for themselves than usual, many turned to sex work. Women in the North also faced such detriment, and it wasn't uncommon for military encampments on both sides to be followed around by gaggles of sex workers. In wartime Washington, D.C., there was a booming trade of over 400 brothels. After the Civil War, sporting man culture became more prevalent. This hedonistic lifestyle of eating, drinking, gambling, and smoking at male-oriented locations went hand-in-hand -hand with the growing trade of commercial, full-service sex work. Brothels, seeking to serve the best clientele, became more luxurious and decadent. Many of the country's budding red light districts offered sporting guides and blue books for men to find the best workers. In New York in the late 19th and early 20th century, there were Broadway theaters with call girls for special balconies. Increasingly in cities with sporting man culture, these powerful tycoons and capitalists could keep their indiscretions discreet, as the fanciest brothels with the best madams ran tight ships and held prominent positions of power. It wasn't uncommon for brothels to be owned or financed by upstanding businessmen, though these landlords, and also the customers, weren't denigrated like madams and sex workers. But more on that in a moment. As for the growing number of streetwalkers at the end of the 19th century, many cities and towns realized that they were benefiting from fining ladies of the evening rather than criminalizing them with jail sentences. But sex workers contributed to their communities with more than just fines. They donated money, helped the needy with food and clothing, started legitimate businesses, or sent girls to college. But these positives didn't quell anti-prostitution sentiments during the progressive era, which we've talked about in previous episodes of Let's Talk About Sex History. A number of exposés like 1893's Maggie, A Girl on the Streets, discussed urban lives and sex work to an increasingly alarmed group of American reformers. For a long time, and still for a lot of Americans at the top of the 20th century, prostitution was viewed as a necessary evil that protected virtuous women from the passionate sex drives of men. Basically, people were saying, we need sex workers or all the men are gonna go out raping all the good women. This necessary evil was considered evil because the sex was commercial, non-marital, and sinful. But again, necessary. As such, many cities had red light districts where women could ply their trade in relative safety. Children, the natural consequence of the commercial sex trade, could be watched by friendly neighbors and camaraderie was shared and bonds were made. In 1897, New Orleans City Alderman Sidney Story, who wanted to save property values by stopping the spread of brothels, rushed through an order which forbade all prostitution in New Orleans outside of a 20-block district northwest of the French Quarter. For nearly 20 years, the town was known as Storyville and brought in millions annually to the city of New Orleans. Tulane and the Archdiocese of New Orleans owned property in the district. Madams in the brothels were influential in public and political life thanks to their discretion and the upkeep of the workers. And they made good money too. Storyville madams like the well-known Lulu White charged clients for liquor marked up to 400%. In 1998, archeologists searched the area which now held the Iberville Federal Housing Projects and found gambling chips, pots of now evaporated rouge, cheap cologne, and French perfume. But the most historic bits of Storyville are the infamous blue books, guides that listed brothels by race and price. Octoroons, or white women with the supposed one-eighth of black blood in them, fetched premium prices. Blue books were given free to railway passengers and sold by newspaper boys at bars and barbershops. And one edition described why New Orleans should have this directory, including, because it's the only district of its kind in the state set aside for fast women by law, and because it puts the stranger on a proper and safe path as to where he may go and be free from holdups and other games usually practiced upon the stranger. Blue books called the women of Storyville jolly good fellows and there was a hierarchy. Women who worked at cheap cribs or small rented rooms for tiny sums of money weren't included in the blue books. Instead, these books mostly described the so-called Tenderloin 400 or cream of the crop. When Chinese laborers were brought into America in the 1860s to build the dangerous railroads, thousands of Chinese women also came as prostitutes. Initially, there were mainly independent contractors, but soon, Chinese men realized there was a fortune to be made off of these women. Soon, Chinatown brothels were filled with women who had been kidnapped or sold by their poor families or enticed by fantasies of marriage, and they often ended up in San Francisco. 
Girls were procured in China for around $50 and then sold at auctions for up to $2,800. They were then said to be exploited for four to six years, though many didn't survive that long because the women were expected to die of disease, drugs, or suicide. They were frequently relegated to cheap cribs, earning 25 to 50 cents a customer, and they didn't get to keep any of that money. They were pimped and trafficked by Chinese men to other Chinese men and also white men. While San Francisco officials looked the other way, the money was then used to invest in Chinese American communities. Later in the 1880s, Japanese sailors did a similar thing when they kidnapped women and brought them to Seattle, San Francisco, and Los Angeles to be pimped out and served as seed money for the local community. Though a number of progressive era women advocated for these brutalized Asian American women, most weren't aware or particularly interested in their struggle. The realities of early Asian American women here was starkly different to white American prostitutes who usually worked independently or under madams and brothels. These workers, often consensual, got to keep all or portions of their earnings rather than being pimped out. And by the way, pimps as they would come to be known wouldn't arrive for some time. Back in 1859, Dr. William Sanger studied 2,000 prostitutes on New York's Blackwell Island to investigate their motives. Half of them had worked as domestic servants, one of the most poorly paid jobs, before entering the sex trade. Another quarter worked as seamstresses, and the remaining bit were abused and abandoned wives. This was a trend that continued, in which white women turned to sex work in the face of economic pressure or to escape domestic abuse. One full-service sex worker told the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison that, I know you mean well by coming here but I don't know how much good it'll do. Instead of coming here, you had better go around to some of those factories and shops that grinds poor girls down to $2 a week and get them to pay better wages. It's no use, a girl can't live on what she gets. Even still, white slavery became a popular media theme. Tales of white women being snatched from home and forced into sexual servitude by evil minorities galvanized an anti-prostitution movement. The white slavery panic was in part a way to rationalize all the middle class white girls with good breeding who became prostitutes, and they were a significant number. While Asian women were actually being abused and exploited, there was and is very little evidence of a white sexual slavery trade in the early 1900s, but it led to 1910's Man Act. This act made it a felony to transport any woman or girl for the purpose of prostitution or debauchery, or for any other immoral purpose. The act quickly demonstrated its racist consequences when in 1912, heavyweight boxer and one of the earliest black entertainment celebrities, Jack Johnson, was convicted of sex trafficking when he traveled with his white wife across state lines. Within four years of the Mann Act, all consensual full-service sex work was illegal, except for in Storyville. By 1916, 47 cities had shut down their red light districts, and by 1919, that number was 80. When red light districts were shuttered, commercial sex was driven underground. Vice squads spent a lot of time targeting sex workers, or women they believed to be sex workers, again, they really didn't make much distinction, at public establishments, a trend that continued until the 60s and 70s. Carrying a condom could mean you were assumed to be a prostitute. And this is something that is still true today. Madams were replaced more frequently with pimps, and there were less independent girls than ever before. Ironically enough, because there was now no attempt to identify and categorize consensual sex workers separately from sexually coerced women, coercive sex work and pimping thrived. Black women and other minorities were harassed and arrested the most by police, as they were the faces of prostitution. This is a good time to mention that historically, sex workers say they received the most abuse not from Johns or pimps, but from the police. In the 1970s, the ACLU reported that black women were seven times more likely to be arrested for prostitution than white women. So prior to the complete criminalization of sex work in the early 20th century, men did benefit from the sex trade in a number of ways. They owned and invested in brothels and as cops or government officials received bribes and payoffs. And of course, they were also the most frequent patrons of sex workers. But when full service sex work was driven underground, men became the primary beneficiaries of the money made by sex workers. Very few women, those with the utmost race and class privilege, operated independently. Most full service sex workers during the middle of the 20th century made their livings casually by supplementing vanilla work with a few chance tries here and there, or as members of a pimp stable. 
Though 1972's anthropological investigation, Black Players, The Secret World of Black Pimps, would delve into the seedy world of pimping, a largely black male profession, perhaps the most famous work on pimping was by Iceberg Slim, who was born in 1918 and came of age as a pimp from the 1940s to 1961. He documented pimps bringing their stables of women into his mother's hair salon and wanted the kind of money they amassed for himself. The pinnacle of pimp culture was a patriarchal control over sex workers or sexual victims through emotional or physical abuse and manipulation. New York was home to a lot of pimps and sex workers. By 1971, Prostitutes Promenade and The Deuce were coined for the stretch of space along 8th Avenue between 42nd and 50th Streets in Times Square. Prior to this, most of the relatively few streetwalkers were white and looked classy, but more minority and lower class white women were coming into the picture and there was a lot more broad light propositioning. In the late 60s, New York had seen an increase of white youth migrants, and around the same time, solicitation and prostitution became misdemeanors. Hotels began renting by the hour, and the state of New York lowered the drinking age to 18, attracting out-of-state visitors. There was an increase in crime, and the high-profile muggings and stabbings of two European tourists were blamed on prostitutes. These changes in street walking culture led to more high class prostitutes establishing call operations so they could screen clients and avoid police harassment. But of course, this required a phone, transportation, and access to men willing to spend more generously than those who frequented underground brothels and street walkers. This concept of access to technology aiding or hindering a sex worker continued in a similar fashion with the introduction of now taken for granted things like the fax machine the pager, and the internet. In the early 70s, police commissioner Patrick Murphy linked full-service sex work with crime and porn, and even recruited a New York Times reporter to write about the link and further ruffle anti-porn and sex work activist feathers. In summer of 1971, Mayor Lindsay established a task force, which led to thousands of sex workers being arrested to little effect. The sex trade in New York and other cities like San Francisco only grew stronger due to the economic turmoil of the 70s. Cities found their ways to profit off of sex workers like they had decades earlier with fines and kept sex workers from putting down permanent roots or organizing. Cops issued threats and harassed women with move-along policies in which women were arrested for prostitution and were snitched on to neighbors, usually leading to a loss of housing. Meanwhile, the newly forming women's liberation movement was trying to determine whether or not sex work was liberating or oppressive and where feminist ideology stood on the subject. Anti-sex work feminists, like the progressives of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, believed that no rational woman would willingly engage in full-service sex work or porn or go-go dancing for that matter. And they began frequenting sex worker strolls to chat with workers about getting out of the life or confronting the poor working conditions depending on how they saw the occupation. Prominent radical feminist Sarah Brown Miller argued against both porn and prostitution, using now discredited psychiatric studies that claimed that most sex workers were sexually abused as children and suffered from shame and loss of self-esteem that careens into promiscuity. At a 1971 conference on prostitution, anti-sex work feminists were utterly startled by actual sex workers. Described one taken aback organizer, they didn't fit the stereotype of prostitute. One, Donna, looked like an exotically dressed high fashion type. The others looked like you and me. Most of them were middle class prostitutes, high priced prostitutes, white call girls with expensive habits. Another had an Ivy League education, and they were, they said, feminist prostitutes. Combahee River Collective, the noted black lesbian and feminist group, wanted to bring attention to the murders of 12 black women universally described as runaways, prostitutes, or drug addicts whose society said deserved to die because of how they lived. Back in 1962, a woman named Margot St. James was falsely convicted of prostitution in San Francisco and she was fired from her job as a cocktail waitress. And the thing was, she actually wasn't a sex worker. She told the judge, your honor, I've never turned a trick in my life. To which he responded, anybody that knows that language is obviously a professional. St. James couldn't find work except for a few odd jobs and in an ironic twist, turned to sex work. 
This is the experience that ultimately led to St. James establishing Coyote, or call off your old tired ethics, a feminist sex workers rights group. Coyote held hookers balls in conventions with money put towards good causes, like fighting against mandatory STD tests and jail quarantines for women accused of prostitution. And Coyote also pressured for better legal representation for those who were arrested on prostitution charges. The most significant impact of Coyote was that it built up a network of information about the similar and unique issues faced by sex workers throughout the country. Other groups that helped sex workers treated them like fallen women who needed to be rehabilitated, while Coyote sought to make them more conscious and riled up about their collective mistreatment and marginalization. The organization also gathered statistical data that confirmed the rampant gender bias in prostitution arrests, few consequences for Johns and pimps. Furthermore, Coyote made note of racial issues. Writes historian Melinda Shadavert, prostitution arrests reinforced the racist stereotype that women of color were more sexually promiscuous and immoral than white women and supported public policies of discipline and control, including forced sterilization, public welfare cuts, and increased law and order patrols in poor neighborhoods. But Coyote, like current sex workers' rights and advocacy groups, faced a significant opposition, pandering charges. Because full-service sex work was and is illegal, Coyote couldn't advise women how to operate safely or house women without being accused of running brothels. These constraints limited projects and services for sex workers in need. By the time AIDS, Reagan Republicanism, and anti-porn sentiments rolled around in the 1980s, progress for Coyote and other sex work decriminalization efforts was halted. Even still, high-class call girls could still make good money off of the country's greediest men stockbrokers. Call girls were benefiting tremendously from the creation of call forwarding, paging services, answering machines, and the first iteration of cell phones. One thing I hope I hammered home in this season of Let's Talk About Sex History is that with shame comes stigma and with stigma comes violence. When Gary Leon Ridgway, the Green River Killer, began murdering sex workers in 1982 that we know of, the routine term used for murder cases involving prostitutes was no human involved. This flippant attitude towards the lives of sex workers impacted the lives of other women too. When Susan Brown Miller interviewed a police sergeant about rape in 1971, he claimed that every one of the 35 complaints filed that month originated with prostitutes who didn't get paid. This was the attitude that allowed the routine violence perpetuated against sex workers and those mistaken for them. Ridgway explained his choice in victim thusly. I picked prostitutes as my victims because I hate most prostitutes and I didn't want to pay them for sex. I also picked prostitutes as victims because they were easy to pick up without being noticed. I knew they wouldn't be reported missing right away and might never be reported missing. I picked prostitutes because I thought I could kill as many of them as I wanted without getting caught. He killed over 48 such women in his lifetime. During Memorial Day weekend in 1990, a 21-year-old named Chandra Matta picked up three sex workers in Arlington, Virginia and murdered them over the next 36 hours. Seven years later, groups organized the first known vigil for slain sex workers in his victims' memories. And this reflected a change. At least 502 known male serial murderers have existed in America between 1970 and 2009, and 3,288 of their victims were women, and 32% of those women were sex workers. According to Shadowvert, in the 1970s, police solved only 16% of cases involving sex workers. In the last decade, between 2000 and 2009, 69% of known cases have been solved. This is a significant increase that reflects the growth of respect paid to full-service sex work as a profession and a growing desire to see the trade decriminalized and made safe for those who work it. From the 80s until now, there's been a wealth of cultural activism through books, art, and media that humanizes sex workers and legitimizes their existences to the mainstream. But even these positive gains are hemmed by a culture that continues to dehumanize sex workers in video games, music, and movies. The difficult existence of many current sex workers is compounded by the 
conflation of consensual full-service sex work with sex trafficking. The most official estimates say the overwhelming majority of the world's millions of trafficked humans are in forced labor in manufacturing, mining, and hospitality industries. The main focus is on victims of sex trafficking. To be clear, the forced exploitation and rape of kidnapped children and adults is real, but it's also strengthened by laws that seek to criminalize consensual full-service sex workers. The FOSTA-SESTA bill passed last year was marketed as a way to stop sex trafficking, but the actual law targets consensual sex work. It focuses on how online platforms facilitate sex work, aka sites that make it safer for sex workers to exist, trade information, market, or screen for potential clients. The language of the law is vague about what prostitution is and makes no distinction between consensual sex, dom work, cam shows, or the like. Because full service sex workers often can't rely on adequate policing, can't organize into groups that advance their interests, or increasingly can't use the internet to advertise and screen for clients, like their counterparts half a century earlier, they might come to rely more on pimps and also face higher chances of abuse and danger. People who are actually trafficked against their will find little sense in reporting their abusers to the cops, since they are more likely to be criminalized and arrested than their non-consensual clients or pimps. It has also been regularly reported that cops rape or extort sex from sex workers. For undocumented people who are trafficked, they can't go to law enforcement either because this can mean deportation. There's also the fact that anti-sex work laws are inherently racist, as this country has historically stigmatized women of color as prostitutes. Remember how I said in the 70s the ACLU found that black women were seven times more likely than their white peers to be arrested for prostitution? That shit is still happening today. As detailed by Juno Mack and Molly Smith in Revolting Prostitutes, in New York between 2012 and 2015, 85% of the people charged with loitering for the purpose of prostitution were black or Latino, though they only make up 54% of the population. The writers go further and detail how black women are a significantly high proportion of people incarcerated for human trafficking offenses and are usually charged with more serious prostitution charges than their white peers. episode, I covered how full-service sex work has evolved in America over time. Taking into consideration all you've learned about America's sex history, all of the racist, classist, and misogynistic bits, what's your opinion on the role of pussy and power in a country that has been historically patriarchal? Is sex work a necessary evil? I hope you don't believe sex is evil, but hey, maybe you do. Nah, I doubt it. Because if you've been paying attention, you'd be able to see that patriarchy and capitalism have made full service sex work historically necessary, lucrative, and dangerous. Yes, all three of those at once. Furthermore, I hope you've learned that a society that doesn't respect whores and simultaneously groups women into categories of women and prostitutes, where the line is easily subjective according to individual tastes, is a society that does not respect women at all. I certainly hope you guys have enjoyed not only the season finale of Let's Talk About Sex History, but the full first season. <laughs> Want to see more great long format videos like this? Well, you can over on Patreon, where a one to three dollar monthly pledge grants you access to exclusive videos and essays. Plus, your pledge produces more great free content like this. Check the link in the description box below for more information. Also, be sure to like this video and subscribe.